Hello and welcome to our guest session where we've got Mike Singleton, who's tuning in from the States. He's going to tell us a little bit more about himself and his background. But Mike is a senior analyst at Invictus Research, and I've seen quite a few of his videos now, and I think they're, I think they're awesome. They, they really break down and deconstruct what can be quite a complex macro environment, particularly given how pretty ferocious 2022 has been. Uh, into something a little bit more digestible and also practical if you're a student trying to consume this data and information and news into something more kind of investment strategy wise. So I'll hand it over to Mike and he's going to walk us through a kind of slide pack, how you know his investing philosophy and his process and, and how he makes sense of it. So Mike, welcome and uh, over to you. All right. Thank you for having me, Anthony. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Mike Singleton. I'm the founder and senior analyst at Invictus Research. And uh, as a quick summary, our goal at Invictus is just to provide research on the business cycle to keep it really simple and deliver it through short, easy to watch videos, um, sort of like the business section of the newspaper, but from the perspective of a global macro investor rather than a journalist. Before starting Invictus, oops, let me go to the intro slide. I was uh, working at a private investment firm called Broad Run Investment Management. I was the senior most analyst on the investment team there. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. I had the chance to, to lead about $100 million worth of investments over my time there. Uh, prior to that, I worked briefly at T. Rowe Price in Main Street Capital. And on the right there is a picture of my lovely wife, Mimi and I, on our wedding day. And that picture it is our son, John, who was born about a month ago. All right, let's take a step back. Uh, most investors, particularly as it relates to macroeconomics and the business cycle, are really all over the place. We're living through a very interesting time in financial markets. Pretty much everyone has access to unlimited data. One might say we're all drowning in data, retail and professional investors alike. Uh, in our view at Invictus, information really has very little edge by itself. Um, you have access to the same data that I have. Uh, hedge funds have access to that same data. So uh, if there's no informational edge, uh, where does the edge lie? Uh, the edge is in how you analyze it. And believe me, there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to macro, probably more than any other discipline within finance. Um, so what do you what what you need when you have a you know an excess of information like this, what you need is the right frameworks for putting it all into context. You need mental models, as Charlie Munger might say. So what is a mental model? Uh, it's an analytical framework for understanding reality. Uh, good mental models describe reality well. Poor mental models describe reality poorly. Uh, if you don't have mental models in investing or in life, uh, you will tend to just be overwhelmed by all of the data that life throws at you. Um, <laughs> the various religions are sort of like mental models. Uh, political parties provide mental models. Again, mental models are just ways of putting um, the data that we encounter in everyday life into context and making sense of it all. Um, and like I said earlier, uh, mental models are good if they describe the world accurately and they're bad if they don't. And a large part of your journey as an investor is figuring out which mental models are the right ones to make central to your process. Uh, one of the frameworks, one of the mental models that's most central to our process at Invictus is our growth and inflation framework. Um, what does that mean? Uh, well, it says that growth and inflation are the two primary variables that drive the returns of the liquid asset market. So stocks, bonds, commodities, and currencies, and nothing else really matters. Everything else is either A, noise, or B, an input into our growth and inflation outlook. Almost every analysis we do at Invictus, uh, whether it's looking at the employment situation or the credit cycle, or we're doing some type of market analysis, uh, it's always with the end goal of trying to get a, a better grasp on the growth and inflation outlook. Um, anytime you're presented with new information, anytime anyone, any, any analyst of the business cycle is presented with new information and you don't know what to do with it, a pretty, a pretty good first step is to think about how it might change your outlook for growth and inflation. Okay, so growth and inflation drive the asset markets, uh, but there's more to the story. Uh, you, can't, you can't just you know look at them willy-nilly. You have to have the right method of interpretation. So we look at growth and inflation in a very specific way. Um, we look at the year over year rate of change. So this year versus the same time last year. The absolute level is really less important than the rate of change. Um, in other words, we care less about growth or inflation being high or low. We care more about it getting better or worse. Um, and this is sort of logical, right? 
it doesn't really matter to the markets if growth is high in absolute terms. If growth is about to crash, uh, you know, stocks will do poorly. It, likewise, if growth is very low in absolute terms, but it's in the process of bottoming, then stocks are very likely to do well. At this point, I think if you're new to macro, hopefully you're breathing a sigh of relief because it has a dis as a discipline, macro has a reputation for being very complicated, but you know, now you really only need to worry about two things. Um, and it gets even better than that because forecasting growth and in inflation, um, well, step, take a step back, not forecasting, but growth and inflation are not random. They're not unpredictable. They are cyclical, right? Uh, and they move in trends. So if you want proof of that, we will go to the next slide. Uh, here we're looking at the growth and in inflation cycles going back to the 1950s. And you can see that they look like a sine curve. Uh, if you remember from trigonometry, they trend and then peak, trend and then trough, trend and then peak over and over and over again. Growth and inflation are both cyclical. And together, the real, that's real growth on the top, um, not nominal growth, I guess I should clarify. Uh, together, the real growth cycle and the inflation cycle form what we at Invictus call the business cycle. So if you're an astute listener, you might've realized that because growth and inflation can only go up or down, uh, this creates the possibility of four distinct economic regimes, each of which represents a distinct phase in the business cycle. You've got early recovery where growth is accelerating, but inflation is still going down. Reflation where growth and inflation are going up together. Stagflation where growth is going down, but inflation is going up. And deflation, uh, which is when they are both going down together. So the first two regimes, early recovery and reflation are broadly risk on. And the bottom two, stagflation and deflation are broadly risk off, risk, uh, risk off, risk on. Uh, you could think of them as being good for risk assets and bad for risk assets. It's just sort of the, the parlance. Um, we'll talk more about these regimes later, but uh, before we do that, we're gonna spend a couple of minutes talking about the growth cycle in the US and uh, what the implications are. So on this slide, we're looking at the Institute for Supply Management's Manufacturing PMI. PMI stands for Purchasing Managers Index. Uh, so what is this? Why do we care about it? Uh, why are we showing it to you? Uh, and Victus, we think the ISM manufacturing PMI is one of the best cheat codes in macro. And yet so many investors um, still ignore it for some reason. It's a diffusion index. It's something called a diffusion index. It's constructed from the survey responses of purchasing managers at manufacturing companies. So if uh, a lot of you are new to macro, that might not have helped at all. Um, so I'll do my best to simplify it. Uh, but this is only a very slight simplification. It's not really that complicated. Purchasing managers are asked in a survey are business conditions getting better or worse? Uh, if they say better, then this line goes up. If they say worse, then the line goes down. Uh, that's it. It's pretty much that simple. The PMI is indexed to 50. So above 50 means positive manufacturing growth and below 50 means negative manufacturing growth. Although keep in mind, we're still more interested in the rate of change here than the absolute level. So the PMI is just another way to measure growth. That's how we use it in Dictus. We like it because it's high frequency, meaning it's reported monthly rather than say quarterly for GDP. And we also like it because um, it's a measure of manufacturing growth. Manufacturing is very, very cyclical um, relative to services. It's very sensitive to economic conditions. And so it tends to lead uh, other measures of broader growth like say GDP. Um, in any case, the important takeaway from this slide is simply that the ISM manufacturing PMI uh, measures economic growth. It's a way of tracking the growth cycle. So uh, if you want evidence that it tracks growth and you don't believe me, uh, you can see the PMI here next to the year-over-year -year rate of change in GDP. They look very, very similar and that should make a lot of sense because they're both reflections of the same underlying growth dynamics in the real economy. Of course, GDP is reported quarterly, like we just said, instead of monthly, and that makes it less useful despite the fact that GDP essentially gets all of the headlines. But that's just in the US, right? This is a really interesting chart, I think. Uh, we're obviously looking at the PMI again, and we're comparing it to the OECD index for global growth. And you can see that the US growth cycle and the global growth cycle actually track each other shockingly closely in my mind. Uh, why is that? Well, we live in a very globalized world, especially with regards to commerce. I will also add that the US by itself has an enormous impact on the global business cycle. First of all, it accounts for about 20% of global output and accounts for a larger percentage of consumption. The US tends to be uh, a significant consumer of global goods and services. Uh, 
And on top of that, the US currency, the US dollar is the primary global reserve currency. Uh, so the US business cycle has significant impact on every other country's business cycle. And as a result, the US and the global business cycles are largely synchronized. All right, here's another interesting chart. The PMI against the CRB commodity index, which is essentially like the S&P 500, but it's for commodities. Uh, so oil, natural gas, corn, copper, gold, wheat. And you can see there's a fairly close correlation there as well, which should make sense, right? All else equal as growth increases, so does aggregate demand for commodities. Um, think lumber for homes, copper and steel for cars, oil for powering industrial activities. That uh, boost in demand in turn pushes up prices. The price of anything is just a function of supply and demand and the PMI represents demand. So all else equal, faster growth should mean higher prices for commodities. So in short, um, just from looking at the ISM manufacturing PMI, you can get really valuable information about the US growth cycle, uh, the global growth cycle, the commodity cycle, and all of this is just from looking at one diffusion index. So that's pretty good, pretty good bang for your buck there. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about this, Raul Paul actually has a great video covering a lot of this on YouTube if you're interested. It's one of his uh, oldest Real Vision videos. So that's a good resource. All right, so we've talked about growth and inflation. Uh, we've talked about the four economic regimes a little bit. We've talked about the ISM manufacturing PMI and uh, its implications for the growth cycle in the US and globally. But all of this macro stuff so far has been somewhat abstract. Uh, and to be honest, it's only useful insofar as it actually helps you make money. That's your, your goal if you're an investor in the asset markets. So, you know, if you're forecasting GDP correctly down to the decimal point, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna make money. It doesn't matter unless you know how and why that information drives the asset markets. And the good news is that there is uh, a relationship between the financial markets and the real economy. And the relationship, uh, maybe this is counter consensus, the relationship is fairly straightforward. The financial markets are a reflection of the underlying economy. That's the relationship because growth and inflation trend and cycle, so do financial markets. And the financial markets do so because the economy do so, does so. Um, it's also important just on a high level to understand that each business cycle resembles prior business cycles, not just in terms of growth or inflation going up or down, that's, that's obviously true, but also in terms of the asset market's reactions. Why is that? Well, because similar assets will always react in similar ways to similar economic conditions in aggregate, not, not specifically. All right, so if you want evidence that uh, markets reflect the economy, this next slide should be pretty clear evidence of that. On the top is the ISM manufacturing PMI, which we just talked about quite a bit. And it's overlaid with the year-over-year -year rate of change in the S&P 500. Obviously, that's a very close relationship. Uh, in my opinion, it's a very logical one. Um, but let me give you the right read on it in case it's not perfectly obvious. When growth is accelerating, when the PMI is moving up, stocks tend to do better. And when growth is decelerating, going down, when the PMI is going down, stocks do worse. Uh, it really is that simple. Don't overcomplicate it. Economic activity drives trending stock market performance. I think anyone who says stuff like, uh, you know, the market is broken, price discovery is destroyed, the Fed's ruined the markets, uh, that's not right. And they're probably just suffering from about a bad performance. I, I don't know anyone who's doing really well that says stuff like that. Um, on the bottom there is the CRB commodity index, which we just talked about too. Um, it's a basket of commodities. We're looking at the year-over-year -year rate of change versus CPI inflation, which by the way, is also measured in year-over-year -year terms usually. And they look very similar. Why is that? Well, the price of commodities is certainly an input into inflation. So that's part of it. But commodity prices are also the most liquid and economically sensitive constituent of inflation, right? When there's an economic shock, uh, what typically will react first, the, the cost of your rent or uh, the market prices of freely traded commodities. Well, obviously it's the latter. I would also point out that generally speaking, the markets front run the reported economic data by about three months. Markets are forward looking. They are uh, you know, what a classic investor would call a discounting mechanism. And that's an extremely important to understand. The markets take economic information and they price it in in advance. Okay. All right, back to the four market regimes. We have early recovery, reflation, stagflation, and deflation. And on this slide, 
We're showing the back test for the various equity sectors against those four economic regimes. And if you pause and just look at the page, I think you'll find it uh, to be extremely common sense. When the market is pricing in better economic conditions, you know, you know faster growth, healthy inflation and whatnot, um, you'll see riskier, more cyclical exposures tend to outperform stuff like technology and consumer discretionary stocks and financials. Why is that? Well, people are, the market is discounting. People are going to buy new iPhones, new cars, new houses. They're going to be taking out loans. Um, when the market is pricing in worse economic conditions, it's the defensive exposures that tend to outperform utilities, healthcare, consumer staples. And again, that should be very logical, right? Uh, most people don't stop paying their electric bill or their health insurance premiums or stop buying toothpaste, even if there's a recession. That said, I will uh, give a word of caution on back tests because I think everyone in the finance industry has sort of a thing for back tests and anything quantitative. Um, I think there's the, uh, the sentiment that because something's quantitative, it's handed down by God, and that's not true. Um, all back tests are highly sensitive to your back test parameters, where you set dates, how you're defining growth, et cetera. Uh, and second, every business cycle is different. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Real estate is generally defensive, right? Which again, should be logical. It should pass the common sense test. Most people uh, and companies really have to be in trouble before they stop paying their rent. But if you looked at 2007, eight, nine, that was a risk off market, but real estate underperformed the broader market. Uh, doesn't that contradict the back tests? Yeah, it does. But of course, if you remember, or if you've seen the big short, there was a real estate crisis going on. So if you had just bought real estate stocks in 2007 because the back test said that they were defensive, you know, you would have gotten your clock cleaned. So the best way to view these back tests is that they are just guidelines. They are for setting expectations. Um, they're not for predicting the future. This next slide, we're looking at the same economic regimes, but instead of looking at equity sectors, we're looking at style factors. Uh, What's a style factor? It's just a way of grouping together stocks that have similar characteristics. And therefore, usually to some extent, trade together as a group. So think small caps uh, versus large caps, high beta, low beta, defenses versus cyclicals, and so on and so forth. Uh, again, this slide should make a lot of sense intuitively. The top half of that square is risk on, early recovery and reflation. When growth is accelerating, that's risk on. So uh, in those regimes, you should be seeing riskier exposures outperform small caps, cyclical, high beta, high leverage, low liquidity, et cetera. On the bottom, you have uh, the two risk off regimes. So you should see largely the opposite. Large caps outperform, defensives outperform, low leverage, high liquidity. Um, and also another high level comment, if you see a back test that doesn't make any sense economically uh, or intuitively, it's probably not a great back test. Uh, common sense is a very important skill when interpreting a back test. Next slide is just another way of visualizing those same uh, back tests on the prior two slides. Two things I wanna point out here in particular, because they might be a, a little bit uh, surprising right now with inflation where it is. Um, in developed markets, so think largely the US and Europe, risk appetite, liquidity, strong performance from risk assets are all pro-cyclical with growth and inflation. Uh, drawdown risk moves left on this chart. Drawdown risk increases as growth and inflation slow together. And there are a variety of explanations for this, which we can maybe touch on later. But on a high level, the reason is that developed markets are rife with naturally deflationary forces. So um, over the last 40 years or so, when inflation has kicked up, it's been largely benign, and uh, at least relative to pre-1980. Uh, so de deflationary forces have been, or deflationary shocks have really been the larger risk to the markets since around 1980. Uh, versus inflationary ones. All right, so at this point, I have to apologize because I've lied or at least been a little bit misleading. Uh, earlier, I said growth and inflation are all that matter. And there's a sense in which that's true if I really wanted to, you know, <laughs> stretch the truth a little bit. Um, but there's one more thing that we really need to get a handle on, and that's monetary policy set by the Federal Reserve. The reason we talk about this last uh, after growth and inflation is twofold. First, growth and inflation are primary. That's really, really important to understand. Uh, they drive the majority of price action across the global asset markets. And second, growth and inflation um, largely drive central bank decision-making. Nevertheless, it's still important to talk about this separately, I think. <laughs> 
Luckily, understanding monetary conditions is much easier than most people make it out to be, particularly if you're equity focused. Um, so first, what do we mean by monetary conditions? Um, and Victus, we define it as the impact that the Federal Reserve has on liquidity through the financial markets. Let me sip of water real quick. We call it inorganic liquidity um, because it's the result of an exogenous force, not free market behavior. In terms of stocks, all you really need to know is at the bottom of the page there, the bottom left. Um, tighter policy means higher discount rates for discounted cash flows, lower asset valuations. Think the price to earnings ratio in the case of stocks. Easier policy means the opposite, lower discount rates and higher asset valuations. Um, and this is all else equal, right? Obviously there's never just one factor affecting stocks. The best way in our view to measure monetary conditions is through real-time market indicators like uh, the dollar relative to other currencies, uh, mortgage rates, mortgage spreads above and beyond the risk-free rate, um, the relative performance of growth equities, real rates, yield curvature. You can also look at some reported data like the Fed funds rate or the Fed's balance sheet, but you have to understand that those data sets will always, always, always lag the market. If you want to see how monetary conditions interact with different equity risk exposures, uh, as in a as in a back test, uh, check out the right side of the screen there. I'll just summarize it quickly. Um, easier policy, lower discount rates, disproportionately help high growth, high valuation, riskier exposures. Uh, of course, the flip side to that is when liquidity is taken away, they tend to crash, which is what you're seeing uh, in certain parts of the stock market right now. All right, that brings us to another important part of our process, what we call confirmation from the asset markets. So it's one thing to understand the economic data and build a model. And uh, we certainly do a fair amount of that in Victus. Um, but there's a second part to our process. And this is actually the more important part. We have our fundamental view from our bottom up work, you know, growth or inflation will go this way or that. But we will not invest on that until the asset markets are confirming it. We want validation from the asset markets before we start underwriting new investments with real capital. Um, why? Uh, why is that? Well, it's because human beings, including us at Invictus, might forecast the business cycle incorrectly, but the asset markets as a whole will never forecast the business cycle incorrectly, never. Um, I, I pretty much guarantee it. Moreover, as we mentioned earlier, the asset markets will actually front run the economic data every time with virtually no exceptions. So you'll give yourself a huge edge in terms of forecasting and more importantly, portfolio management by studying the bond market, the stock market, the commodity market, the Forex market, and learning what they have to tell you about growth and inflation. So here's some quick evidence of what we're talking about. On the top there, we've got a ratio of small cap stocks to large cap stocks. In the middle, we have spot price of copper versus the spot price of gold. And on the bottom, we have the US 10-year yield. And um, a lot of people have never seen a chart like this before, but they're surprised to see that they have a very similar profile over time. And the reason is that they're all trading on the same underlying macro dynamics, um, more or less, namely growth. All three of these indicators largely trade on the rate of change of economic growth. So, uh, if we were to uh, do sort of a thought experiment here, if we believe based on our fundamental outlook that growth was going to accelerate, we would like to see all three of these indicators going up, confirming faster growth. Uh, over the last year or so, we've actually seen a historic divergence in these charts, right? You can see usually they move together. Right now they're kind of moving in opposite directions. It sort of looks like a Neapolitan ice cream uh, carton, um, but we, we can talk about that later if you want, uh, maybe a conversation for another time. Uh, if you want more evidence that studying the markets will refine your forecasting and more importantly, uh, help you make that better investment decisions, then look no further than Stan Druckenmiller, uh, probably the most successful hedge fund manager of all time, famously compounded his client's capital at 30% per year for 30 years with no down years. And I think it's maybe like one or two down quarters, possibly making him the uh, best hedge fund manager of all time. And who knows if anyone will ever recreate a track record like that. But uh, Stan says, by far the best economic predictor I've ever met is the inside of the stock market. I don't mean the stock market, I mean the inside of the stock market. 
Uh, what does that mean in practical terms? Well, it basically means what we just talked about. He has his own expectations for growth and inflation, but he respects what the market is telling him. Uh, you know, he respects things like the copper gold ratio, small cap, large cap ratio, performance of cyclical stocks versus defensive ones. Um, he wants validation from the markets before investing. If you've ever listened to Stan talk, you know, on YouTube or whatever, uh, you know how seriously he takes market internals. All right, one last mental model before we wrap it up. Um, but first, we need to answer a question, a question that we haven't addressed uh, explicitly, and that's on the topic of time horizon. So over what time horizon is the market, uh, are the markets an accurate reflection of underlying economic activity? Um, to use a round number at Invictus, we say about a month, although obviously, you know, that's not a rule. It's just sort of a principle. Um, but generally speaking, any market move longer than a month is a reflection of some uh, economic development, the most important of which is always growth. Another way of saying that, the growth cycle drives trending performance in the asset markets and uh, probably always will. But what about the shorter term moves? Uh, what about the seemingly random noise in the markets? Um, well, a lot of it is noise, it doesn't mean anything, but we associate a lot of that uh, noise to positioning, uh, sentiment, and psychology. So the mental model here is trending moves are driven by economic fundamentals and short-term moves are driven largely by positioning, sentiment, and psychology. And the good news is that analyzing sentiment and positioning data is fairly straightforward in principle, although it's more challenging in practice. And the reason it's straightforward in principle is because it tends to be mean reverting. Uh, positioning tends to oscillate from bullish to bearish. And in a perfect world, we wanna be adding exposure when everyone is bearish and reducing when everyone is bullish. And obviously the reason we would wanna do that is better returns. Uh, when positioning is really stretched in one direction, even small counter consensus surprises can cause big moves in price. You know, in the, we have it in the quote there, but think of it like a rubber band. The further it's stretched, the more violently it'll snap back on a catalyst. Um, and Victus, we use a number of sources to evaluate uh, positioning and sentiment, including investor surveys, flow of funds data from the Fed, which is longer term data, uh, the weekly commitment of traders report from the CFTC, and we also look at a lot of options data. So that's the uh, overview of the Invictus process. I don't know if Anthony has any questions, I'm happy to answer them or whatever you wanna do next. Yeah, let me, um, I do have a couple of questions I was noting down and uh, as you can see on the screen as we as we go there's there's definitely some good resources that um, that Mike has so you should definitely check those out if you've uh, enjoyed the breakdown there but yeah a couple, couple of things I guess um, one just to give a kind of further context to the listeners is what what does your daily because they're thinking about careers as well so I'm trying to tie in that element what does a typical day look like for you then because if you're eliminating out let's say the kind of blast and, and and kind of all the headlines that are coming out uh, every single day. Are you follow? How much is it following tracking, say, single items of major news flow, like a central bank speaker saying X or a company stock coming out with an earnings report of Y, or to then looking at data and just looking at the growth and, and various different, or or looking at the other types of um, information that you said with market internals. What's a typical day in your life look like from your analyst's perspective? That, that's a great question. And uh, it's funny. I think that a lot of investors really like Warren Buffett, right? And Warren Buffett famously says he spends all of his day reading. He says he subscribes to you know eight different newspapers. And so I think that within the industry, there's this thing that everyone wants to read newspapers and be on top of the news. And I think there's the perception that there's some edge from that. Hmm. Um, I think <laughs> I, I really admire Warren Buffett and I've read all of his letters. Uh, I don't think his edge actually comes from reading the newspaper. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, at least personally, I sort of separate uh, my professional work and analysis and reading the news. I consider that more entertainment. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One is that the news is written by journalists and journalists tend to be backward looking just because the nature of their profession is backward looking, right? I, I report on something that's just happened. You can't report on the future, but the markets um, are discounting mechanisms like we mentioned earlier. And so um, 
the worldview that an investor has is just very different from a journalist. And so that's part of the value add of Invictus is, you know, we're looking at the world the way an investor looks at the world, not the way a journalist looks at the world. And maybe that seems like a fine distinction. But uh, as an investor, where you get your information is really important um, because in subtle ways, it can affect how you think. Um, in terms of what we actually spend our time looking at, almost all of our you know, information is taken from, uh, you know, basically we call them government reports, the BEA, the, the various uh, Federal Reserve surveys and the markets. So that's where we get information that we use for making investment decisions. And, uh, you know, I, I like staying on top of what Elon's doing with Twitter too, but uh, it's just not, it's not a part of the decision-making process. Okay, cool. And then the, the other thing was one of the slides I saw that when you were explaining about the risk on risk off and it had the kind of spectrum between the different assets and where they would sit on the most extreme in terms of, I guess, risk appetite was crypto. Now, now crypto as an asset, what's your views there in terms of where we're at at the moment and then from the clients that you talk to, to the analysis and correlations that you see with more traditional assets, if any? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. So I think the most important thing to understand is that crypto is a risk asset that trades with financial conditions, very closely with financial conditions. So. I'll try and break this down in a way that makes sense. Um, in fact, there's two, there's two constituent parts to financial conditions, excuse me. <coughs> Not used to talking this much. There's two constituent parts to financial conditions. There's economic conditions and there's monetary conditions, right? So, uh, and, and they're the two inputs into liquidity. So liquidity gets better when economic conditions improve which should make sense, right? Uh, if the economy, if I think the economy is gonna do better, I'm more likely to transact with you, Anthony. And then the second constituent to liquidity is the inorganic liquidity that we talked about earlier. That's basically the Fed, right? So Bitcoin does better in uh, uh, risk on regimes where economic conditions are improving, people are feeling good. You know, they're you know, buying a car, they're investing in altcoins, they're getting stimulus checks, whatever. Um, and crypto is also, you know, uh, an asset with zero cash flows, which sort of de facto makes it a very long duration asset. So it's very sensitive to the discount rate. Um, so when the Fed is raising rates, uh, that's really bad for crypto. And when it's, uh, you know, easing monetary policy, reducing rates, uh, particularly real rates, crypto um, tends to do very, very well. So right now our outlook on crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, the altcoin complex is bearish. And the reason is, uh, the Fed is explicitly saying it wants to take the wind out of risk assets. And uh, there's only one institution in the world that has the credibility to say something like that, and it's the Fed. So <laughs> if they're promising us they're going to do it, we believe them. And we have some precedent for this, right? Um, if you look at a chart of real rates and a chart of the price of Bitcoin, uh, they look fairly inverse. And if you look at the last hiking cycle, the last policy cycle, which ended in 2018, you can see that... Uh, Real, uh, as real rates went up, Bitcoin crashed. The Fed's do, saying it wants to do the exact same thing. It wants to take rates above neutral. Uh, I, I will say I'm impressed with how well Bitcoin and, and crypto generally has held up. I, I would have thought it would be down a lot more. It's still down a lot. I think that's probably important to keep in perspective. But uh, as long as the Fed is saying, we want to tighten, we want to bring rates up, we want to bring real rates up, we want to take the wind out of risk assets. Bill Dudley saying, uh, you know, stocks need to feel more pain. I wouldn't touch crypto. I'd be looking for tactical opportunities to add, you know, short exposure. Okay. And then uh, the final one was where you had the, what I thought was really excellent breakup with the with four regimes. Where do you see where we're at right now in, in the regimes? And I know it's, um, you were talking about a month to kind of let things and trends materialize and so forth and, and a bit of time for that to see through. But what, how do you see where we're at in the context of, right now and that transition, but then also with what the market is kind of aware of with where we're heading with the soon to be tightening of policy and the subsequent impact that we could have then for the second half of the year? Uh, that's a very good question. <clears throat> so I think it's very odd. There's, if you, I'll refer to uh, the framework we use in our last monthly market outlook. There are three parts to our thesis right now. Uh, 
One, we expect growth to continue declining. It's already declining. We expect that to continue. The asset markets are clearly pricing that in. Um, two, we expect inflation to decline in the coming months. Obviously, that has not happened yet. We think April, the April print is very likely the first decline in year over year rate of change terms. Um, I'll add the asset markets aren't totally pricing that in yet, right? Inflationary exposures are still doing quite well. So we don't really have validation from the asset markets on that part of the thesis. So we're not short inflationary exposures yet uh, because we don't short uptrends. We don't short strong momentum. Uh, our back tests tell us that's a horrible idea. <laughs> and so we don't do it. And uh, I've certainly lost money uh, betting against those things in the past. And then the third thing is tightening financial conditions, uh, which is like we just said, the Fed's saying it's going to tighten, it's happening, yield curves are inverting, uh, rates are moving up or have been moving up across the curve. We saw um, you know, the, 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 the Dixie dollar index is moving higher, mortgage rates are spiking, clearly financial conditions are tightening. Eventually that's going to break something. Um, that's sort of the history of uh, you know, central bank policy making in the Western world. Uh, and when that happens, that, that will happen through crushing demand. So that'll push growth down further and it'll also reduce inflation. So that's around the corner at some point in terms of when it actually happens, uh, we're watching closely, but you know, I could, and I could guess it's gonna happen in the next couple months, but uh, really part of being a good investor is um, you know, keeping an eye on things and changing your mind when information changes. And right now, you know, the market is still saying stagflation. Um, you know, faster inflation, slower growth, tightening policy. We expect that to transition into deflation, but uh, we leave it to the market to tell us exactly when that is. Cool. All right. Well, look, on, on that, we'll, we'll look to wrap up the session. Mike, thank you very much for, for giving up some time to, to share your thoughts and, and share your process. Um, I will share in the, the description of this video all the links to Invictus uh, and to Mike, so feel free to, to connect with him through those means. And uh, Mike, thank you again from the community and uh, catch up with you soon. My pleasure, Anthony. Thank you for having me.